Good afternoon and welcome to this BBB National Program's live webinar on health-related claims and advertising. And happy Valentine's Day, everybody. My name is Mary Engel and I'm Executive Vice President for Policy here at BBB National Program. I'm delighted you can join us today to hear from three experts who will help break down the do's and don'ts of health-related advertising, point out some common pitfalls to avoid, and help you to understand the interplay between FDA regulations and advertising law as applied by the FTC and the NAD. Speaking today will be Rakia Pippins, a partner at the law firm of Arnold and Porter, Rand Almondieri, who is a partner at the law firm of Hamid Talati and Wasserman, and Eric Yunus, an NAD staff, senior staff attorney. Rand and Rakia have many years of experience advising clients in the healthcare space, and Eric has handled many uh, health related advertising claims at the NAD. So we have true experts in this area who have thought deeply about health claim substantiation and are well equipped to explain the nuances of making health related claims in advertising. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rakia who is going to get us started. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm really honored to have the opportunity to serve on this panel with Eric and Ren to really address an issue that's important to all of us. And that is, how do you support the health benefit claims that you wanna make for products? We only have an hour and there's a lot that we're gonna to try to cover in that time period. And so what I will share is advertising law basics, after which I'm gonna speak a little bit about what constitutes a reasonable basis for health benefit claims. From there, Rind is gonna step in and talk about common pitfalls that we all see when we're looking at purported support for health benefit claims. And then Eric is gonna come in and discuss some recent NAD cases that can be great examples for all people attempting to navigate this space. There are also some housekeeping issues that I wanna note. Um, the first is, yes, this recording will be distributed. Um, NAD will distribute it tomorrow, along with a PDF of the slides. And if throughout the presentation, you have any questions for us, please feel free to submit them to the chat and time permitting, we will try to address some of them um, during the hour. So with that, let's jump in. So first we're gonna begin with some advertising law basics. and. So I think it's always important to note that when you're dealing with health benefit claims, there really are two federal agencies that are involved in this process, and it's the FDA and the FTC. Um, they have both participated um, or cooperated with each other through a memorandum of understanding since the 1970s, which indicates that FDA is going to have primary jurisdiction over issues dealing with labeling, while the Federal Trade Commission will have primary jurisdiction over issues related to advertising. I note this because it comes into play a lot as we're addressing how to substantiate claims in the space, especially when it comes to self-regulation before the National Advertising Division of BBB National Programs. And that while the NAD doesn't enforce either statute, it definitely does pay attention to how the agencies would address issues. And therefore what happens in those contexts can be helpful when you're trying to identify your support. Today, we're going to focus on what's really necessary with respect to supporting their advertising and health benefit in particular advertising. And there are some basic principles articulated in the FTC's policy statement on deception and also used by the NAD that everyone should be aware of. The first is, of course, all advertisements have to be truthful and not misleading. And you have to have substantiation both for your express claims and for your implied claims before they are made. That comes up a lot with clients where they want to put it together later, but the law requires you have it before you put, make the claim in the marketplace. It's also clear that generally the level and type of substantiation that's required is going to vary or can vary depending on the type of claim. Um, here we're talking about a very narrow subset, so the standards are a little bit more clearer on, on what's expected but also qualifying information about attributes of use of products or services have to be disclosed whenever you're making a claim to avoid a misleading message to consumers. So it's really important to think about what qualifiers are necessary. The last thing, which is really important to note, is that while claims require substantiation, puffery does not. Or the reverse is, what I'd like to say is that, yes, there's a small set of things that are puffery that don't require support. But I will say that while a marketer will try to say that everything is puffery, NED and FTC president have shown us that very few things are. And in that context, I always like to use this great example of an old NAD case from 2006 
involving Gorilla Glue way before people were trying to put it in their hair. <laughs> they were just making claims related to the fact that Gorilla Glue was the toughest glue on planet Earth. This claim was actually challenged by Elmer's Glue, who said, look, in the context of toughest glue, that's an actual claim about how strong the adhesive is with the product. Gorilla Glue took the position, no, when we say toughest glue on planet Earth, it's puffery. NAD did not agree and said that in that context, you really could have a definition or an objective claim conveyed about how tough it was. But what I like to always flag is that after the decision, Gorilla Glue modified its advertising saying it was for the toughest jobs on planet Earth, which was considered puffery because in that context, tough was a lot more vague and more difficult to define. And I like to always use this example as evidence that even things that could be puffery in a context and isolation can become a product claim if paired with things that can make it an objectively measurable claim. NAD has also dealt with this issue in the context of health benefit claims. There was a case involving P&G and their NyQuil product a couple of years ago, which involved the tagline we all know of NyQuil, the nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, aching, fever, best sleep you ever got with a cold medicine. And what NAD said is when you have the best sleep with a cold medicine in the tagline, that's puffery. People know it's a part of kind of the, the, the comical, like, um, tagline essence of how NyQuil promotes it, is P&G promotes the NyQuil products. But when you made the claim NyQuil is the best sleep you ever got with a cold medicine in isolation, it became a measurable claim in which you could really link whether you got better sleep or your best sleep from using the product compared to using a, um, a control. And so it's always a good reminder you can provide to members of your team on how to avoid um, either stay in puffery or understand where you'll have a claim you have to substantiate. So with that, we'll get to the meat here, which is that we understand all objective product claims must have a reasonable basis. And one thing that I want to note is that in the context of health products, there are a lot of claims that are made and reviewed by NAD, including doctor recommended claims, preference claims, number one claims based off sales. We are not dealing with any of those today. We could have a whole other hour program on them. Today, we are solely going to focus on health benefit claims that are related to how the product performs with respects to efficacy. And in that context, a reasonable basis is standard that we have to meet. And the question becomes, what constitutes a reasonable basis for health benefit claims? Well, the good news is that we have some guidance on that. And I think the first thing we always have to remember, which goes back to one of the first slides I shared about the joint regulation of the FTC and the FDA in this space, and that is that NAD really does try to harmonize its own efforts when it comes to rulings or recommendations by an applicable government agency. So when it comes to health-related products, if you're dealing with a device that is in commerce pursuant to a 510K clearance or a drug, whether prescription or over-the-counter, that has a clear approved um, indication or is in commerce pursuant to a monograph, or you're using nutrient content claims for your food products, where you can really point to FDA having taken a position on the support necessary for the claim and that you have met it, you can use that alone to establish that you have a reasonable basis to convey that message in advertising. And NAD will generally try to adhere to that. Where we really get in trouble though, or where it's really often not clear sometimes for clients is what to do when there isn't a clear approval, clearance, or guidance from another regulatory agency. And that's what we really want to dig into today. Historically, what has been applied is a, a general definition for competent or reliable scientific evidence. And what I want to note is that the definition for competent or reliable scientific evidence was put together originally by the FTC as a way to apply what's referred to as the Pfizer factors to health product claims. And that, in essence, was acknowledging that while it's a flexible standard, generally when it comes to a health-related performance claim, we'll need test analysis, research studies, or other evidence based on the expertise of professionals in the relevant area that have been conducted and evaluated in an objective manner by persons qualified to do so 
using procedures generally accepted in the profession to yield accurate and reliable results. Um, in practice, I want always want to flag this is because it was an acknowledgement that competent and reliable scientific evidence still has some flexibility. And while generally it does need to be tests and research and studies, there are some unique examples where other evidence, because it's, ex ex it's accepted by experts in the field, could be enough. And you think of things like a 510 click clearance, for example. Now, I will note the FTC has um, issued a health products compliance guidance as a slightly different definition for competent and reliable scientific evidence. And Eric will address this a little bit in his in his presentation, but I want to note that this definition really is the origins for the actual substantiation standards that um, are applied in the NAD context and which you can use to help safely make your um, health benefit claims with limited risk. And with that in mind, I'm going to take a few minutes here to note five categories of health benefit claims that are commonly put forth before the NAD and some general principles that should be kept in mind by companies to ensure they have the, the type of support that would be expected before making the claims in commerce. The first category are general performance claims. And these are instances where you're going beyond the indication if it's an OTC drug or prescription drug or beyond the clearance indication for a device um, to state how fast the product works or how long it lasts. Uh, the NAD has been very clear that these types of claims require competent and reliable scientific evidence. And that typically will be need to be in the form of well-controlled human clinical testing. I say this because we have had clients who might want to come to us with survey data to try to support onset of action or duration of action claims. And NAD has been clear that that's not able to support the claims because there weren't enough controls in place to really ensure first that it was only the product that led to it working as fast or lasting as long as they thought it was, and that um, the consumer wasn't using or subject was using other confounding variables. Um, there are a few exceptions where NAD has permitted long-lasting or um, starts, to, starts to work fast type claims without clinical testing. An example would be the dry mouth line of cases and where uh, on appeal, NAD found, the NARB found that formula claims could be used to support this data because there was substantial evidence in practice parameters and other things discussing doctors understanding of how fast these products work and 510k clearances that had done it in that context. It's a rarity, but I do want to acknowledge that it's, it, it is possible in certain circumstances to support it, but generally you'll need human clinical testing. The second category are claims that we refer to as establishment claims. And these are claims when you want to say it's proven, clinically studied, clinically proven, or use a numeric number to convey a level of improvement or some other type of benefit for the product. These are called establishment claims because the claim itself was viewed as promising that there was actually testing done to support the claim and establish its truth. These are the highest risk of all the claims that you can make in that there really is an expectation of very robust clinical testing to support the claim. And I also want to emphasize that in addition to there having to be robust testing that has statistically significant and consumer relevant results, a lot of attention is often paid to whether the results closely align with the touted claim. And so if you want to go as far as to say something has proven or have another numeric, you really want to make sure you've kicked the tires on the testing to make sure that it has appropriate controls, that the population aligns with the population that it's intended for, the directions are consistent, et cetera, to make sure that it meets that standard. Um, the only other thing that I always want to make sure I mention here is that generally, if you say clinically proven, two studies are expected or a very, very strong, um, robust gold standard study. And so um, definitely think about the differences between saying proven versus tested, studied for the number of tests that you may need in that context. For the third category, I mean, we often see this, especially when you're dealing with products that have been in market for a long time or new entrants, you want to compare yourself to a market leader or explain why you're best. And there are a lot of NAD cases involving comparative efficacy claims. I think the biggest thing to keep in mind is 95, or I would say even 99% of the time, NAD is going to expect head-to-head -head testing between your product and whatever product you are comparing yourself to. You should be using the product that is most similar to your product unless 
you are going to refer to the very specific product that you're comparing yourself to. And it does permit apples to oranges comparisons, but in that case, you can't just use the brand name. You have to specify the exact comparator product that you're using. Um, there are, and I always want to be clear, some exceptions to needing head-to-head -head testing. There was a case, for example, um, involving Nasacort years ago in which the, there was a claim when Nasacort was launched that it was the most effective allergy over-the-counter allergy product. It was, but there was head-to-head -head testing versus all categories except for um, certain um, the diphenhydramine in particular products. And NAD ultimately still accepted the claim because there were several practice parameters and other published peer-reviewed literature making it clear that it was well understood in the medical industry that intranasal steroids would be more effective in that category of medication and therefore no testing ever would have been run because it would have been a waste of money to do so. Um, again, head-to-head -head testing is the expectation, but if you don't have it, there are rare instances where if you can truly so show the principle is generally accepted, other support may be accepted. Next, I just wanna get into the second to last category that comes up often, and those are market comparisons, whether it is that you are superior to everyone else in the market or that you, no one is better than you, which is often referred to um, as a parity claim, right? Um, the big, most important thing to keep in mind is that in, in order to support a claim like that, NAD is going to expect you to have testing or data against a significant portion of the marketplace, which generally is about the top 85% of the marketplace. That doesn't mean that if you know someone is better than you or will outperform you and you're in that last 15%, you can keep them out. If you're aware of another product, you have to involve them in the data. But generally speaking, absent that um, counter rebuttal evidence, if you have testing or uh, related data showing your superiority or parity to the top 85%, you will meet that standard. And I want to flag, um, I have the Similac case here. I know there are other cases that were on other slides. We share them as examples of cases you can go for the precedent and go back to kind of get more insight into how these standards have been applied. Last but not least, I just want to note that up to claims are often very much of interest to companies in this space. And there was a time where we all were very nervous about it. The FTC had issued a report probably about 10 years ago now um, in the energy saving space where they took the position that up to means me too to consumers. <laughs> and so you almost couldn't make any of these claims, but that is not what happened in practice from enforcement and not how the NAD has treated it. Generally, they do just require that an appreciable number of consumers be, have been shown through your testing to achieve a benefit for you to use that up to claim. Um, the NAD has not formally quantified what that means, but in practice, we typically, practitioners in this space advise clients that if you using no no single digit numbers, like the top, you can use that 10% <laughs> mark, you might be a little higher risk doing that, but you can do that. Um, I think the 15%, the 85% threshold is usually a little safer, but just to know that if you're making an up to claim, you shouldn't be using the outliers, the most extreme benefits. You should try to get something that's on that 10% um, mark or between 20 to 10% on the um, bell curve as your number to show that it's clear that an appreciable number of people could potentially achieve that benefit. Um, and with that, as I've given this foundation, I think it's important to really think about the um, pitfalls that come when you really get into the weeds. And I'm so happy that Rind can jump in to discuss that. Yeah, well, thank you, Rikia. That was um, a great overview of the types of claims that are out there and the requirements and great NAD decisions that you pointed out. So I want to turn now to some of the issues that I've come across, and I'm sure Rikia has come across and Eric as well in, in reviewing NAD cases that involve a variety of health-related claims for products ranging from supplements to foods to cosmetics, OPC drugs, devices, you name it. And just when you think you've met the requirements for competent and reliable scientific evidence, even then there are some considerations that you want to keep in mind so that you can ensure that you can actually rely on those studies for your specific product and your specific claim. Um, and so relevance, this is probably the, the number one issue that I see amongst the types of claims that I've reviewed. 
we'll often see really great studies, RCTs that hit all the criteria for being competent and reliable, but for various reasons, they just aren't a good fit for the claim or the product. And as a general rule, substantiation needs to be relevant to the claims and to the specific product, not just reliable. In other words, the support, it, it, the support may not be relevant to the product um, or the claims, even though it's, it's reliable. So a few areas to consider, uh, the formulation and the composition. Did the study use a specific botanical extract, for example, with a particular active constituent profile? You know, typically the health benefit derives from a particular active constituent. And sometimes even the species of the plant, uh, for example, American versus Korean ginseng or American or European elderberry, you know, in those cases, we might see a different constituent profile and that may affect the efficacy. Um, so it's, it's good to ensure that the study is using the same type of ingredient or, or formulation with that, with that same active constituent profile, if, if that's um, appropriate. And um, also we see this too, I'll say with, with botanicals where the preparation method might be different. Again, the extraction method may affect the efficacy, something we see a lot with botanicals. Combination of ingredients. Um, does the addition or omission of certain ingredients impact the efficacy? This is also an issue that's highlighted in FPC's um, health product claims guidance. It may not be as big of an issue for topical products uh, or where you're adding vitamins like you know, vitamin C or D to a supplement, but with ingredients that are pharmacologically active, uh, again, especially this comes up with botanicals, it's important to consider whether certain ingredients have an antagonistic or synergistic effect. Um, these synergies too can sometimes impact safety. So that's another um, thing to consider too, whether uh, the safety is somehow um, impacted with the combination of ingredients. All right, some other key considerations for relevance, the form and root of administration and whether these match, and if not, how does that impact efficacy? And this comes up if you have uh, a study that is looking at a topical product, but your product is ingested, um, or whether the route of administration and the study, it might be a beverage, but you're selling a capsule. And it's important to consider this because the ingredients could be metabolized differently or utilized in the bodily, uh, body in a different way that may impact the efficacy. In the study population, this is one that I, I see quite a bit. Um, you, know, you need to consider whether there are differences between the population in the study versus the target population of your product. Sometimes we see uh, products targeted to women with studies only in men or products marketed to children where the studies are in adults. Um, and, and what we often see in the dietary supplement in industry is studies in diseased or pre-diseased, like pre-diabetic pre populations. And sometimes NAD has flagged this in decisions as well. But uh, you know, it's important to note that with supplements, you know, these are intended for healthy populations or to maintain health. And that can be really difficult to demonstrate in a typical study, uh, especially with vitamins, minerals, or other nutrients that we consume as part of our diet and that are essential to our health. So it can be tough to isolate and show that supplementation uh, with the nutrient alone was responsible for the study benefit. It can also be costly to show that uh, some of these improvements in wellness occur over the course of multiple years and sometimes even unethical uh, to deprive subjects of a certain nutrient for purposes of a study. And I think regulators and NAD uh, understand that for the most part, but you know, the bottom line is whether you can rely on a study in a disease population, regardless of the product type, uh, will be a fact and claim specific determination. And it's another situation where consulting uh, an expert in the field can, can help address that. Uh, also, endpoints, you know, does the claim extend beyond what was actually measured? This comes up quite a bit with cognitive claims and studies on, on cognitive endpoints. That's probably the best example. For example, a study that focused only on working or short-term memory, but the claim is related to long-term memory, or the product claim has to do with uh, alertness, but the study looked mainly at focus. Um, 
Also, it comes up sometimes with weight loss claims where the study is examining metabolic markers uh, versus actual weight loss. So matching those endpoints can, can sometimes be a challenge, but something that it's important to take a look at. And, um, you know, on this topic of relevance, I like to usually end with, with this quote from FTC, which I think does a really good job of explaining um, relevance and why it's important. And with these relevance issues, I, I know I've, you'll hear me say this again quite a bit, that consulting with an expert in the field can, can really be useful to determine you know, if a study should be conducted on your product or whether the gaps in the existing evidence can be addressed. So another pitfall, and this one is uh, tricky, clinically meaningful results, or sometimes, you know, we say consumer relevant results. And, you know, we sometimes see a well-conducted study with statistically significant results compared to placebo, but the results are so small that consumers really wouldn't detect a, a difference or it wouldn't be relevant to them. So in, in those cases, the claim may be deceptive or misleading. And here I have an example of a questionnaire assessing sleep quality where the score only improved by, by an average of, of 0.5 points. And, and maybe my math is off, maybe that's not statistically significant, but you get the point. In some cases, it can be these very small changes that are detected and uh, they can still be statistically significant. And the study reports that, but really it's a small change and, and consumers may not find um, that difference to be noticeable when they use the product themselves. Um, again, I think this is where an expert opinion can help or where appropriate, um, looking uh, or doing an additional assessment of that same endpoint. Maybe it's a more subjective assessment to determine whether the study subject actually noticed a benefit from that, from that change. Also in this one, I think is, is pretty straightforward, but it's not something that, that, that is always um, addressed in my experience, and that is considering the totality of the evidence. Basically, you can't cherry pick studies and you must consider all relevant studies, the good and the bad. Um, and then also ensuring that the individual studies are, are consistent with a larger body of evidence. And you know, just because a, a study provides strong results, and it doesn't necessarily mean the product or the ingredient is, is um, proven. So if you're using a clinically proven claim, for example, you should be prepared to address whether um, there are any conflicting or inconsistent results. And finally, and another good reason to consider the totality of the evidence is potential class, class action risk. So under the prior substantiation doctrine, it's, it's well established that plaintiffs can't demand substantiation for advertising claims. However, if the weight of the evidence shows a product doesn't work, that can support an allegation of false advertising and that the, the claim that is being made is, is actually false. So that is something to watch out for. And another tricky one, qualifying language or disclaimers, uh, which are, are not always helpful. Um, but sometimes disclaimers, as, as Rikia mentioned, you know, they, they can be helpful or even required uh, to avoid deception. Uh, for example, saying something like results not typical for a weight loss claim, uh, but instead providing the amount of weight consumers can expect to achieve, the timeline and, and that use of the product should be combined with diet and exercise. That's a really good example of how qualifying, um, I'm sorry, uh, disclaimers can be really helpful. Um, you know, vague terms are, are likely inadequate. Uh, I'm often asked whether using may or helps means that less scientific support is required for the claim. For example, you know, may help uh, with joint health or may support immune health. And the simple answer is no, um, it doesn't help to add those, those terms in there as consumers are still going to expect the promised benefit. FDC's guidance also notes that terms like promising and preliminary pilot are likely to be understood positively by consumers versus convey limitations about the science. And if you think about it, consumers aren't likely to understand the significance of, of what a preclinical study means or even what open label means. And calling attention to these issues in a disclaimer, for example, can also call attention to the fact that you have a weak study. So that's something to consider. Um, and finally, disclaimers and qualifiers cannot contradict the claim. So for example, if you're making a clinically tested claim, uh, but the disclaimer indicates results weren't significant, you know, in that case, it's, it's really not going to help you to have that disclaimer. 
Um, also, too, I, I remind clients the Deche disclaimer, um, the FDA disclaimer that these products um, or the you know claim wasn't wasn't evaluated by FDA. Uh, that is is not going to to help you um, in terms of substantiation, and it doesn't serve to reduce your liability. It's just a requirement for structure function claims um, under under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and doesn't affect your burden of substantiation, and it won't cure a disease claim either. Just as a reminder. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to provide a few takeaways um, to help you avoid these common pit, pit, uh, pitfalls. Number one, um, you know, ensuring the studies are relevant to the product and the claims. Uh, just remember that matching the dosage isn't enough. Um, you really need to uh, look at these other factors like formulation and composition. And for botanicals especially, it's important to pay close attention and make sure that the study is a good match for your product. Um, also, statistical, statistical significance uh, may not be enough. You need to consider whether results are meaningful and will be relevant to consumers. Um, also, look beyond the positive studies. Consider negative studies as well. Uh, qualifying language uh, cannot always cure bad substantiation. Sometimes they also highlight a weakness or limitations of the studies. Um, and so you really need to consider carefully whether those are required or whether it's a good idea to include those. Um, and finally, consider obtaining an expert opinion to address any gaps, um, especially with combination products or where the study population and target population aren't a good match. Um, an expert opinion and specifically an expert in the field sometimes can, can help with that. Um, and, and one more to add, uh, and this is good timing as I turn it over to Eric, is to uh, review NAD decisions because uh, a lot of these issues are addressed in those. Um, there's a wealth of valuable information, so subscribe to the BBB's online archive of NAD decisions. Um, Eric is going to go um, over a few, but I think uh, looking at those decisions and 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 uh, looking to see how NAD addresses these common pitfalls can also be helpful. So, Eric, with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Rend. Um, yeah, and I'll just follow up on what you said about reading the um, NAD case decisions especially in this area where there are often a lot of different claims challenged or um, a lot of evidence is submitted in, in its decisions, NAD does sort of painstakingly go through all of the substantiation that is submitted and, you know, gives it ways in on it. Um, and, and from which you can derive uh, a lot of guidance from your own your own situation and your own issues if you see what worked and what didn't work. Um, especially in this space, uh, we try to make the decisions very informative in terms of giving giving guidance uh, to industry and, and to consumers on, on what to do and what to expect. Um, so we're going to talk about a few of the recent NAD cases uh, that are involving health claims and, and some of the issues that we see often and some of the interesting bits out of these cases um, that we can we can talk about and see some patterns and and hopefully apply in your, in your own uh, your own uh, work um, but but first let's talk about the uh, recent FTC health products compliance guidance um, it was issued in December 2022, um, just around just around the holidays. We got this uh, this guidance issued, which um, it really from the um, as Rakia mentioned earlier, NAD makes an effort to harmonize uh, its decisions with federal guidance, uh, very much so the FTC guidance. Um, so that's that's the good news for everyone out there. There are not really uh, or shouldn't be uh, guidance that it, that is conflicting. Um, but especially when it came to health claims guidance, this document uh, and this guidance that, that came out was very much uh, in, in continuity. Uh, we looked at it as in continuity with what NAD had been doing. Um, a lot of the concepts were uh, in FTC and NAD cases that had been um, had been expressed in practice, um, and and were just and and were documented in formalized more formalized in this guidance. So it really was 
uh, continuity. Um, pr previously, the dietary supplement guidance that the FTC had issued uh, back a while ago, um, NAD had been using that guidance, not just in, for dietary supplements, um, but citing it in health claims more broadly. Um, so there, so there really was continuity, and then some of the specific concepts that um, come up in the in the newer guidance, where uh, the FTC flagged as problems, you know, had also kind of been identified by NAD as potential problems in substantiation. For example, p hacking and um, uh, doing a doing a post hoc analysis to sort of massage the data to to get the results to show a statistically significant. Uh, general benefit, which may not have been there. Um, so, so that's in the new guidance. Um, and But what the new guidance does is it really um, gives another authoritative source of um, where to look for, what to look for in considerations in substantiating claims. There are 52 examples given, and, it, and it's written in a very um, engaging sort of way, which, which, which a lot of different people can can relate to and understand, give you guidance, and it covers subjects that we're not going to talk about today, um, like endorsements and testimonials and clear and conspicuous disclosure. But let's today we're going to focus on the um, on the substantiation part of things. Um, and, and to that, uh, let's let's talk about how the new guidance has defined uh, competent and reliable scientific evidence. So the tests, analyses, res researcher studies that one have been conducted and evaluated in an objective manner by experts in the relevant disease condition or function to which the representation relates, and two, are generally accepted in the profession to yield accurate and reliable results. The research must be sufficient in quality and quantity based on standards generally accepted in the relevant scientific fields when considered in light of the entire body of relevant and reliable scientific evidence to substantiate that the representation is true. Um, I, I did want to mention, though, if, if anyone's wondering, you know, I mentioned that this is a, a continuity we saw it mostly as from, from N80. So it really didn't um, impose, at least it hasn't demonstrated yet, that there are either stricter or uh, looser burdens in, in substantiating claims. It's, it's, just, it's just more of um, more sort of guidance to, to point you in, in certain directions. We'll see if there are more challenges at NAD as a result of this. Um, it, maybe it's given uh, other advertisers more to think about and um, angles from which to challenge their competitors' claims. Um, so we might see that in the future. But um, let's 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 talk about some of the cases where NAD has cited to the new to the new guidance. Um, and, and it's done so in several examples in, in 2023. Uh, the first case here, Mackey Health, this was a, a supplement marketed to, um, to, um, to vision related claims and eye health related claims, uh, improving vision, building uh, macular pigment, uh, addressing age-related macular degeneration, um, and and uh, mention and um, referred to addressing floaters. Um, so there were there were many studies and articles submitted by the advertiser to to try to support this uh, these claims. Um, and I'll just I'll just note a little bit here. There was a uh, one of the studies, we noted that there was a lack of control from which it was difficult um, to, in, to show a cleaning, clinically meaningful benefit in avoiding macular degeneration for a general population because it was tested with on those with atypical macular uh, degeneration. One study did not test the current formulation, uh, which is an issue that comes up in all kinds of uh, substantiation. Um, and it's very important in the health space when you are when you have a formulation and there's a change in the formulation uh, that the substantiation be kept current with that with that formulation. Um, let's go to the next case, memory health. Let's go from uh, the eyes to the mind. Um, and this this product um, also also a supplement uh, had all kinds of claims in sort of cognitive function, 
um, brain health, uh, memory. And uh, what happened here is that the, the advertiser, in, in some respects, pushed it too close to the line in associating the product with neurodegenerative diseases like, like Alzheimer's and the effects of, of CTE, um, putting the, the claims up next to or in, in proximity to uh, discussions of, of those conditions. Um, now, I, I, I think I'll, I'll just note here, the NAD doesn't really get into these regulatory distinctions of whether something is, is being marketed as, as a drug or not. It just looks to whether or not the, um, the, the advertising is truthful and, and supported. Uh, without that, without that, without that, that regulatory um, judgment, we're not we're not trying to enforce regulations, although they may be relevant to to our uh, to to our assessment. And in here, in this case, the um, the studies, um, you know, the the advertiser submitted multiple randomized, double blinded, and placebo controlled studies, and they were peer reviewed. Um, you know, so so what was the problem? Um, there were this this was a situation where uh quantity could not substitute for quality look deeper at the studies there was a lack of statistical significance there were some sample size issues you had some groups that were sort of 12 to 16 people um and then nad also looked at whether there was a fit between the support and the message conveyed uh one of the claims here said memory health improves brain health at any age targeting a general U.S. audience when the study had um, only been conducted on a population of uh, 65 years and older uh, people in, um, in rural Ireland. Um, okay, so the next, the next case, uh, I wish I had time to play this commercial, but unfortunately we don't. Um, this product, the, the Legsercise, uh, this is one of these classic uh, late night TV ads. You see a uh, you can see there um, this this little contraption. Uh, you put your feet on it, and it's like this kind of mini elliptical uh, device where you can, um, you know, you, you just kind of shuffle your feet while you're while you're sitting down. And the advertiser made all kinds of claims about uh, leg uh, soothing leg pain, stopping cramps, uh, resolving tingling and numbness, helping mobility and circulation addressing the um, discoloration of, of, of the skin, you know, you, so you could, you could do this while you're watching TV or, or get your, get your steps in while you're, uh, you know, wa watching a webinar. Um, but then we looked at, looked at the support and, and some of the flaws, um, you know, the advertiser submitted some general uh, literature on the benefits of, of passive exercise. Um, but, it wasn't connected to this this particular product and, and how how it worked. Uh, one of the studies was a not blinded uh, home use test, um, which gave consumers the, uh, the the product to use with some instructions. And you know, we said it was a, a, a flawed, a subjective, self reported kind of. Uh, study that was susceptible to false positives, consumers were asked, do you agree that this helps to soothe lower leg pain or did it reduce swelling? Um, you know, and then, and then the instructions on how to assess discoloration, they didn't take into account uh, whether the effect was temporary or, or not. Um, so, so, the, so NAD um, recommended that these, these claims be discontinued even as modified, um, you know, uh, I think Ren talked earlier about how, um, or excuse me, Rakia talked earlier about the, the Gorilla Glue case and how that was, how that was modified. Um, here, the advertiser tried to soften these claims a little bit, um, but, it, but it just, it just didn't work going from, you know, soothing pain to soothing a painful feeling. It was, it was kind of, it's kind of one of the same, either, either it could soothe pain or, or not, um, despite getting creative. There are also claims in there like uh, it's as good as having a physical therapist in your home without any testing on how, how this, um, how this uh, product was equivalent to physical therapy because it addressed some of the things that a, that a physical therapist might. Um, or that it was an equivalent to walking. It was, you know, not a way to, not a way to get 
uh, not a way to, to get your, your steps in. Um, and, and so what did this leave? What did this leave the advertiser with a, a claim that it provides continuous automatic leg movement and constant movement and flex at both the knee and the ankle joints, which is a description of, of how the product works. Um, I should have mentioned it's, it's called an automatic leg mover. Um, okay. So shifting gears uh, a little bit, uh, I just want to flag this case because um, let's, let's back up. Uh, there are real consequences to whether or not you are making a, a health claim, because as we've talked about the substantiation that is involved in, 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 in making sure you can make those claims. Um, so, you know, a lot of brands like to put kind of a a halo of, of wellness on on products, and um, you know when does it cross the line into making a claim about health? Uh, this this product here, RX Sugar, is a sweetener, um, a, a, a kind of a, a sugar substitute, I guess. Um, and the RX part here, uh, NAD said that the it did not convey a message that this was something equivalent to prescription product or or, or gave a kind of a, a therapeutic benefit. It, it didn't um, it didn't uh, convey any any message like that. It didn't really speak. There wasn't really anything uh, that would give the consumer reason to to associate the product with those kinds of benefit. Uh, some in some other examples, it, it might if it had been sort of connected to to doing uh, to giving a health benefit or or or, uh, or something like that. So in in this case, the the um, the RX at least the RX part of it was okay with nothing else. Um, then let's go to this this next case, uh, Goalie Nutrition. Um, it was uh, ashwagandha gummies, which which kind of came with all kinds of claims about health benefits. Um, and, and NAD recommended that the, the advertiser just continue these claims. Um, there was, there were some weight loss and weight management claims. And, and these were based on studies of, of an obese population when the, the product was, was targeted to a general population. Um, and also NAD noted here, uh, a lack of statistical significance and, um, being clinically meaningful with only 1.5% uh, greater weight loss uh, than placebo shown when, when comparing the, the weight loss. So, so that that was not, um, that was not uh, clinically meaningful there. Um, there were also, uh, there were also physical performance claims, improved physical performance claims that were, um, that were, uh, studied on athletes and when again this was this was targeted towards a general a general population um going back to going back to puffery and that that can have huge consequences in uh in in the health space uh here the product came with a claim that ashwagandha nature's aphrodisiac now the advertiser argued that this, this was just this was just playful um but it came in a context where there was a uh a heart and a fire emoji and in, in proximity to claims about, um, uh, about, uh, sexual function. So NAD said that this was, this was not puffery and, and there was no evidence that, uh, that the uh, ashwagandha did, uh, serve, serve as a, as a, um, aphrodisiac. And, and lastly, there was also uh, a lack of, of testing on the actual product here when formulation was, uh, was it issue? Okay. Um, so, uh, let's get, let's go to the, uh, Navage case. In this case, um, this is a nasal irrigation, uh, product. And just, let's just talk about here some, some claims. And, and we saw a lot of this, uh, sort of in the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, virus prevention, um, sometimes specific allusions to, to, to COVID-19, um, and then sort of more general virus prevention uh, when that when COVID-19 was, was clearly on uh, everyone's mind. Um, now, the, when one of the studies the advertiser relied on uh, was a study of uh, 
60, 20, 20 year old healthy men at a, at a Swedish military barracks. Um, this was not sufficient to uh, serve as substantiation uh, for a general population that is looking for virus virus prevention. You know, so uh, so you know we we talk about uh, getting a representative population studied if you're studying Swedish military recruits or Irish senior citizens or or uh, adver- or uh, athletes anywhere. Um, you know, advertisers need to know that that that's that might stick out, and especially when the claims are, are targeted at a general audience, uh, a test on on a, on a narrow subset uh, may not be submission sufficient. Um, and then, sort of the the mechanism of how the product work was not work was not uh, tested. They tested a, a low volume nasal spray when the product was a is a high volume irrigation product and. Um, I just wanted to flag here. So the, they did have an expert to say that um, it was uh, it was good to good. To, you could extrapolate from that, even though the different mechanisms. Um, but it was didn't have a citation to sort of a, a body of uh, scientific consensus or, or other reliable evidence. Uh, so NAD did did not give it um, did not give it weight. So you, you you when you do have an expert opinion, it's always more um, Given more weight when it's when it's backed by by other evidence and, and consensus in the field. Um, also, here we looked at medical recommendations, um, and, and that that wasn't that wasn't enough, um, especially when they were recommendations for uh, virus using the product for virus treatment and not virus prevention. So, lastly, I, I always like to end on one where um, where NAD. Uh, allowed certain claims to to go forward and here this was uh goop uh which made a a subs a um a a, a supplement product for uh women uh experiencing menopause um and here the advertiser did have sufficient evidence to um substantiate a claim uh, about the nutritional benefits of this product um, and and how it uh, gave nutritional support for women who may experience mild hot flashes, mood shifts, and stress-related fatigue. The advertiser had studies, um, ingredient studies, looked to meta-analyses and um, other literature that that supported this uh, this, this sort of limited claim about um, about the uh, nutritional benefits of the product. Um, so I think with that, we can um, start our Q&A with, uh, with, with a few minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Mary, I think we do have some in the chat, and I'm happy to um, get that get that started in the interest of time, if you'd like. Um, so the the first one, okay. was, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't. Um... No problem. I can um, I can take the the first one that came in a little earlier, um, and essentially this question was. Uh, to request to elaborate on trials conducted in diseased individuals and um, supplement claims and whether it's possible to use that data if it can be bridged to healthy individuals. And the answer is yes, um, uh, assuming that experts in the field would agree that the results can be um, extrapolated to healthy individuals and uh, uh, it, it is possible to rely on that data. It should be in line with you know the greater body of evidence. So if there is um, some conflicting evidence out there that would indicate that um, the the product or the ingredient doesn't work with uh, in, in individuals with more mild conditions, that should be considered. But generally, if you can get an expert opinion um, that that does attest to the fact that it would help um, healthy individuals, I think that can go a long way. 
And absolutely, I agree. And another question that came in was regarding endpoints and determining whether they're equal. I think that was based on a great example Rind had provided. And here, their question was, you know, if you take something like if you're dealing with a supplement related to memory and there's a reference to alertness and focus, who determines if those are analogous versus different endpoints? Mm -hmm. Piggybacking on this theme of what experts in the field think, think, that's why it's really important to check to see if there are validated questionnaires that have been used to assess the appropriate ways to measure the endpoints and benefits that can be associated with certain areas. Like in memory, there's recall versus focus. There are different elements that are well established for um, determining the efficacy of those products. And I think there, that gives you the guidance you need to know whether or not your testing is sufficient to address the endpoints. Always do that search to see if there have been published peer-reviewed studies um, mm -hmm. by medical uh, scientific professionals on how to measure what you're attempting to do. And I'll quickly and I'll address, just, oh, go ahead, Rend, please. Oh, sorry, please. I was going to add quickly. And, and, and that too, I mean, doing that research too, you might unlock too whether changes are clinically meaningful as well. If that's addressed in the literature, if it's not already addressed in your study, that might be a good way to know, does that small benefit, it may be clinically meaningful um, in a description of that validated questionnaire. So I just wanted to, to point that out as another uh, resource for determining uh, whether something is meaningful. That is spot on. There are often are already studies that have addressed that point, and then you don't have to prove it again. Um, someone asked a question about a claim like with aloe or mentioning ingredient. Um, I, uh, you know, Eric, and we recommend we welcome your input on this too. I know generally we've taken the position in industry that just stating it's in there, um, if there's a measurable amount that affects the formula, not necessarily it doesn't always be for efficacy. There could be other reasons that affects it. There might be a way. To, to, to note that emotive ingredient in some way. Um, but if you tie with aloe to an actual performance benefit, then you need the testing showing us the aloe itself that is creating that increase in the benefit that, that has been done. But Eric, I, I'll give the floor to you if that is inconsistent with NAD's approach. No, that that's right, Rakia. Um, you know, simply calling out the ingredient um, will, will not impose any sort of greater uh, substantiation burden to show any kind of efficacy um, if, if that's if that's all that's there and informing the consumer for whatever reason they may want a certain ingredient um, or to distinguish uh, or if uh, uh, advertisers wants to distinguish their product that that's helpful but again you know the the, the context can shift um, you know maybe even sometimes subtly to to making to making a claim uh, a, more, a, a more a broader claim about what the uh, about the benefit that that may provide all right and then we had a question regarding the totality of the evidence um you know what happens if you have two good quality trials um with um you know good results and then one strong trial with no results um i'm gonna just kind of reword this a little bit i think i think you know if you have two good trials, um, you know, and, and they don't have significant weaknesses, like maybe they're smaller clinical trials, and you had you had, um, you know, good results, but, um, you know, they were, you know, otherwise placebo controlled, um, you know, randomized and, and hit some of those other hallmarks for, for being a, a competent, reliable study. And then you have this, this other, you know, uh, stronger, maybe the, the person who asked the question meant bigger, maybe it's a, you know, bigger trial, with null results, um, you know, I'd be interested to hear what Eric has to say. But I think if there's, there, you know, sometimes there's a reason for those null results, and if that can be explained, for example, if there were a lot of unexpected dropouts, if there was some other confounding factor, you know, that you can point to um, that that maybe didn't have something to do with the product, I, I think you might still be able to um, explain away that th th those null results. Um, so it's just a matter of having a good explanation. What do you think, Eric, if, if you have that, that situation? I think if that, if that one study can kind of go through the ringer and be held up, held up to the light, um, yeah, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a reason to think that it would be sufficient, you know, without, with a good explanation, with, mm -hmm. you know, solid, with really strong, uh, protocols and results in the, in the, um, in, in the chief study. Um, it, it can work. It depends on. It depends, yeah. 
Eric, there's another question here that I think is really good for you. Uh, if you, uh, I don't know if you got to see it, but they wanted to know how are these challenges coming to you? You know, did, exercise, RX sugar. You know, I, did wanna, I, or... <laughs> I did want to. I did want to address. I did want to address that. Um, first of all, R RX sugar that was actually brought by the Sugar Association. Uh, I believe his name is so tra trade group. Uh, sugar, just like in the name. Uh, so they that that's where that came from. So that was protective of of their industry. We do have mo a monitoring function, and we do bring monitoring cases in in the health field. Um, these are claims that consumers cannot uh, typically evaluate for themselves. So we will, and and they are consequential. So we will bring them. Uh, NAD will bring it bring a challenge in its monitoring capacity, and. Because the, because the industry is so competitive, we do get many competitor to competitor challenges. All right. It looks like we hit time. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, sorry. Say that with that, we're out of time. We did this very well. Just uh, mark your calendars, September 16th and 17th, the annual NAD conference. And thank you all very much for joining us today. Bye. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.